My name is Jim Burling. I'm an antitrust partner at Wilmer Hale. You now are aware of which panel drew the short straw to follow Bob's remarks at lunch and to start us off in the afternoon to be followed by a panel of judges with substantial discretionary powers, so we will make sure to catch up and finish in our allotted time. Our topic for this panel is at the intersection of patent, Hatch-Waxman, and antitrust law. We are addressing the Supreme Court decision last year, FTC versus activists, which resolved, at least to some degree, a circuit split in connection with reverse payment settlements of Hatch-Waxman patent litigation. In short, reverse payment settlements, for those of you who might not be familiar with the concept, occur when Hatch-Waxman patent litigation is settled and involves something that looks like a payment or some kind of consideration going from the patent holder to the generic challenger accompanied with some agreement that might be viewed as a delay in entry by the generic challenger. These settlements occur, at least looked at at the surface, almost exclusively in the pharmaceutical industry and do so in part because of the peculiar Hatch-Waxman regulatory scheme which allows for infringement without entry. Infringement occurs merely by the filing of an ANDA containing a paragraph four certification. So at the time litigation proceeds, there hasn't been entry, there hasn't been damages necessarily that might be asserted against an entrant. And therefore, the settlement, if it involves consideration, involves consideration for something that may look like a payment rather than like a reduction in a damages claim. Since about 2000, the Federal Trade Commission has led the antitrust attack challenging such settlements as market allocations or payments to defer potential entrants from competing, finding consumer harm in alleged delay of generic entry, which of course historically has had a very substantial impact on market prices. For the first eight or nine years of the challenges led by the FTC and followed quickly by classes of purchasers, the FTC and its theories had rough sledding. The circuits and courts who addressed the issue almost uniformly used something called the scope of the patent test, finding that whether there was a payment or not, if the resolution of the litigation resulted in exclusion that was no more widespread or no more lengthy than if the patentee had won the case, that there wouldn't be any harm to competition. These courts essentially presumed that the patent justified the exclusion, at least until the patent was found invalid or not infringed. The Third Circuit, uh, several years ago in the Cater case, came out differently, accepting the FTC's theory in large part that such arrangements were presumptively illegal violations of the Sherman Act as unreasonable restraints of trade. And as a result of the circuit split, the Supreme Court took the activist case. And uh, as we'll explore today, took a middle path. But in so doing, uh, it may well have left open more questions than it actually answered. Our panel today will try to address those issues. Uh, not only at a doctrinal level, but also at a courtroom and practical commercial level and how we all live in a world after the activist decision. We have an esteemed panel here today to address these issues. Uh, starting furthest from me, Lori Ann Morgan, who is the Vice President of Intellectual Property at Gilead Sciences. Lori Ann joined Gilead in September of 2008 and took her current role as head of the IP area in July of 2012. Her group is responsible for the global protection, enforcement, and defense of Gilead's intellectual property, including both patents and trademarks. And prior to joining Gilead, Lorianne spent about 10 years at GlaxoSmithKline, 
where she engaged both in patent portfolio development, enforcement, and defense, including defending against generic patent challenges, which is right at the heart of what we're addressing today. She's a registered patent attorney and has her law degree from the University of North Carolina. Also a chemistry degree, I should note, from the University of North Carolina as well. Next to her is Phil Malone, who's the professor of law here at Stanford. Phil joined Stanford's law school faculty in July of 2013 as the inaugural director of the Jules Gard Intellectual Property and Innovation Clinic of the Mills Legal Clinic and a professor of law. He is a leading expert in intellectual property, innovation, and cyber law, and he brings to this position nearly a decade of experience in clinical education and another 20 years in litigating antitrust and technology cases. He comes to Stanford from Harvard Law School where he was a clinical professor of law and director of the Cyber Law Clinic at the Berkman Center and where he taught courses in antitrust, technology, and innovation. Prior to his academic career, Phil was an attorney for over 20 years with the Antitrust Division of the Department of Justice, involved in the prosecution of many of the major antitrust cases that <clears throat> the Antitrust Division pursued during that period. And last, immediately to my right, Scott Kempel, who is a professor of law at Columbia Law School. His research there examines the balance between innovation and competition set by antitrust law, intellectual, intellectual property law, and various regulatory laws, specifically including the Hatch-Waxman Act. From 2011 to 2012, Scott served as the chief of the Antitrust Bureau in the office of the New York State Attorney General. And before joining the Columbia faculty, he served as a law clerk to Judge Posner in the Seventh Circuit and Justice Scalia. He holds both a law, and law degree and a PhD in economics, both from here at Stanford. And he's also a graduate of Hartford, Har sorry, Harvard and the London School of Economics. Last, if, if you read the activist decision, you will see Scott's work cited several times in the course of that decision. So we have a panel that is ready to go. Scott is going to start us off giving us a little deeper dive into the background of the Hatch-Waxman setting, the antitrust issues, how we got to activists, and what the activist structure holds. Great. Great. So, uh Thanks to uh, the uh, organizers for the opportunity to be here with you all. It's uh, really wonderful to be back at Stanford. I see uh, a few classmates from a uh, class of 2001, so uh, uh, grateful to reconnect with, uh, with some folks. So what I'd like to do just in the next few minutes is just scene set, as was just mentioned, uh, give a little bit of a sense of what's at stake in these cases, talk through the dynamics of brand and generic competition just a little bit, and then walk through the basic case that plaintiffs have been trying to bring in these, uh, as I count it, 15 or so different drugs post-activists where this litigation is ongoing. Um, before I do that, just to kind of norm us a little bit, quick show of hands, raise your hand please if your work touches on pharma at least a little bit. Okay, so a majority but not everybody. So we'll try to pitch this in a way that appeals to everybody. Apologies if there's a little bit of redundancy for folks who are truly expert. So the first thing to recognize is the nature of the competition here from generic drug makers is to offer a bioequivalent therapy that is a drug that works in more or less the same way using more or less the same active ingredient uh, as, the, as the brand name product. When generic competition arrives, uh, prices fall. And the fall in price is going to be the premise for the antitrust case that we're talking about in a minute. To give an idea, generics today, as of the end of last year, were a little bit shy of 90% of prescriptions and uh, just about 30% of spending. So uh, your casual introspection, the generics are a lot lower in price, is certainly, certainly borne out in the data. Uh, when generics come in, typically the first generic brings the price down by 10, 20%, and then once 
uh, more generics come in, it can fall you know, by as much as a factor of 10. Now let me talk a little bit about how this plays out because once upon a time, generics were perhaps content to wait until all the patents expired and then come into the market. Today, what, what very frequently happens is the generic will make an assertion that any uh, relevant patents are either invalid or not infringed, thereby triggering patent litigation that then gets resolved one way or the other, either through a litigation uh, result or through a settlement. Uh, one of the first of these cases, which I have on the screen right now, involved uh, fluoxetine, uh, Prozac. And that was the famous first blockbuster to have its patent busted in uh, 2001. I'm sure there are people in the audience who will say, well, actually, there was an earlier one. But Prozac was the one that got people really focused, I think, on, on these issues. Uh, one of the things that Prozac helps us see is that uh, there are several different kinds of patents that are put at issue in these litigations. Sometimes it's the compound patent, right? Fluoxetine itself. Sometimes it's some other aspect of the drug. I'll call those secondary patents, although we can talk about whether that's a valid way of thinking about it. In the case of Prozac, uh, the entry didn't occur until the compound patent had expired. And the focus of the litigation was on uh, a follow-on patent that was found invalid. And what we see on the screen is a kind of average pricing. So you can see Prozac's price kind of creeping up, creeping up, and then July 20, 2001 hits and uh, the bottom falls out of the market. Average price falls as the generic enters. Now for those who are true aficionados of the Hatch-Waxman Act, if you count those little monthly dots, you'll see there's about six that stay kind of high and then it drops. So that's the 180 days of generic exclusivity that we might talk about in some detail. So you can see a kind of inflection and then, and then it drops. Now Prozac is a case that got litigated to conclusion. Uh, in retrospect, I think some uh, folks would say Lilly was crazy to litigate this to conclusion rather than settle. There was actually an offer on the table of doing one of these reverse payment settlements, but at the time Lilly's general counsel said oh, we thought that was kind of sketchy from an antitrust perspective, uh, which proved to be prescient, though not for another 10, 12 years, I guess. So this is an example, Prozac is, of litigation going to conclusion. Now what will sometimes happen is that instead of litigating to conclusion, you'll settle. And I want to talk about, briefly, two different kinds of settlement that we could imagine. And I'm going to do this in a, very, uh, in a very stylized way. So what I want to imagine are two different possible outcomes of litigation. An outcome in which the generic wins and we see generic entry right at an early period with consequent uh, static or short-run benefits to consumers from low prices, and an alternative in which the brand wins perfectly legitimately, right, because the, the patent is both valid and infringed, uh, and so uh, competition is, again, legitimately delayed all the way out until the expiration of the patent or patents. So what I want to imagine here is a kind of chunk of uh, consumer benefit, right? Uh, it's indexed to the amount of time where we have early entry. Um, and if the generic wins, we see a lot of that consequent consumer benefit, uh, essentially from the period of litigation concluding all the way out to patent expiration. If the brand wins, we don't see that consumer benefit, but again, legitimately, right? Patents are here for a reason, to induce uh, innovation, to induce efforts to create life-saving drugs, very expensive investments. Um, now, before the litigation concludes, we're in a state of flux, right? We're in a state of tentative uncertainty. It could go either way. Maybe we have a guess about how it's going to go. There might be divergence in the guesses. There might be some convergence among the parties. Um, I want to imagine a situation in which the patent's pretty strong. Maybe it's a compound patent. Uh, or maybe it's a secondary patent that's pretty likely to result in a brand win. So I want to depict that as a kind of expected value for a minute, right? The, the patent will probably win, but not for sure. So the expected consumer benefit from the litigation, it's not as good as if uh, the generic was certain to win. It's a kind of sliver. It's something in between. Now, when parties are trying to figure out how to settle these cases, one of the things they're taking into account is the strength of the patent, is the likely outcome of the patent. 
what you see in a lot of cases is something like what I've just drawn, where they settle on a date certain for generic entry. No cash is changing hands, no other compensation. They're picking a date, right? The date that they pick depends on the likely outcome of the case. The stronger the patent, the later the date, the less generic uh, competition we should expect. Though, again, legitimately, no, no cash is changing hands. And so I've depicted one where it's, you know, it's a fairly late date. Uh, but again, no antitrust concern raised at all by a settlement like the one that I've depicted. There's the same settlement again. So the basic antitrust concern here is, again, taking this kind of what I'll call a fair settlement as a starting point. What happens if the brand, in addition, offers something to the generic? Offers, as in one case, a couple hundred million dollars, admittedly stretched over a few years, so the present value is a little smaller, but several hundred million dollars of compensation. Uh, we'll talk about what kind of compensation should count but for present purposes, let's, let's just assume it's a big sack of cash. Now, the plaintiff's theory in this situation is that starting with the settlement I've depicted, if you hand over a bunch of cash, we will have a predictable result. And the predictable result is that the date of settlement will be later than it otherwise will be. And therefore, we will have less generic competition than otherwise. And therefore, prices will fall later rather than earlier. And that's a classic antitrust concern. Now, under the scope of the patent test that was mentioned before, this would be fine because the settlement date is still earlier than the expiration of the patent. Now, from an antitrust perspective, that just seems like anathema. But this is what a bunch of courts had said. And you could imagine paying more cash to get a later date as long as it wasn't even later than patent expiration. So that's the plaintiff's theory. Uh, it was successful in a few early cases. What I have up here is a depiction of the uh, extreme variation in how courts came out. You had some early wins, an or an early win in the Sixth Circuit, and then you see a string of losses along the right-hand side of the picture. So the Second Circuit and then the Federal Circuit, uh, also the Eleventh Circuit, although you might have argued there was a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, and then finally, we saw in 2012, the Third Circuit coming out in favor of liability uh, and generating the split that the Supreme Court, uh, I'll, I'll say, hopefully, resolved. Addre addressed. 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 Okay, addressed. <laughs> addressed last year, uh, where uh, the court basically said, apply the rule of reason, gave us some signposts that we'll talk about, but how to implement that rule of reason. But uh, I think some people have accurately said, we created a kind of full employment act for, uh, for lawyers and economists in trying to resolve the more than a dozen of these cases, more than a dozen drugs, much more than a dozen cases that we're now looking at in uh, courts all over the country. Okay. Lorianne, maybe you could address a little bit from the pharma company side, um, give us a little bit of the context or your point of view about how these settlements arise and what considerations might be from the company side, at least perhaps coming up to the activist decision. Uh, and we can talk a little bit later about the many uncertainties that might have resulted thereafter. Yeah, just um, a couple of comments. I think that Jim and, and um, Scott have done a good job of laying out the statutory framework in which these Hatch-Waxman litigations are set up. There's just a couple of points that I, I think are worth mentioning to you. Um, the first is Sorry. that there's a, there's a rather um, significant spend involved in designing the innovation and obtaining the patents. And, and the, the numbers that I have I've heard, I don't know, they're a couple years old now, somewhere in the neighborhood of $800 million. The purpose of patents on pharmaceuticals is to allow us an opportunity to continue to fund innovation, to pay for the investment of the drug that is under that patent, to, to pay for the losses in the, the many, the vast majority of drugs that never make it from the bench to the market, and to fund future innovation given the loss rate in the pharmaceutical industry. So strong patent system is integral and essential to innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. And without that strong patent system, innovation will fail. The next thing I want to mention to you is that Hatch-Waxman set up Hatch-Waxman statute is set up in a way to provide very vigorous pro-competitive advantages to the challenge of pharmaceutical patents. And one of the ways it does that is providing the 180-day exclusivity that Scott mentioned. 
and he's correct. Typically, the price for a generic who enters the market, a company that's done no research and development in the pharmaceutical, is about 85% of the brand price. And so that's the most lucrative period of time for a generic pharmaceutical company. There's nothing wrong with that. That is uh, contemplated by the congressional statute that was put into place to balance the interests of brand pharmaceuticals, to balance the in interests of innovation against the very valid interests of bringing low-cost generic medicines to market as early as possible. The environment in which these challenges arise, I think it's important to understand, you know, Scott's depiction, depiction might erroneously lead you to the conclusion that we deal with one of these challenges at a time. And if you've, if you've read the Actavis decision carefully, what you've noticed is that there were three challengers in that case. It's very uncommon for us to deal with one challenge at a time. It's uncommon for us to deal with um, one challenge at a time or even to deal with multiple challenges on different bases. So the more, more likely scenario for a brand company when they're defending their patents is to be dealing with multiple challenges by multiple generics, each of whom may have a very slight variation on the grounds for challenge. And in order for us to maintain our right to the exclusivity provided by the patent, we have to win in each one of those cases. The next point I'll, I'll add on is, is that Scott made is that we are now seeing these challenges earlier in time in the life of a product. Under the Hatch-Waxman system, the very earliest time that a generic pharmaceutical company can file a challenge to the patents on a given product is only four years after the date of approval of that product. So that means as a pharmaceutical company, we've got four years of security that we know our exclusivity will be respected. And if you, again, looking back at the facts of the Actavis decision, they got their patent in 2003. Their patent was not a new chemical entity type patent, and so they were subject to immediate challenge by Actavis. I don't know if it's Actavis or Activist, so <laughs> feel free to correct me. Phil and I were just asking each other what's One of the, the right. many uncertainties left <laughs> open by the case. I'm told it's Activist. We actually had quite a debate about that in a courtroom. I'm sure I'll continue to get out. it wrong today, so I'll, I'll apologize up front for that. Um, so we're seeing not just more challenges <laughs> earlier in the life of these patents, but we're seeing challenges to the, the new chemical entity patents, and I think that's a very important transition. And part of the motivation compelling generic manufacturers to bring these challenges earlier is this 180-day exclusivity. So it becomes really a race on the part of generic manufacturers to position themselves in a way to be eligible for that exclusivity. There's a very, very significant amount of time and money and distraction <laughs> that are involved in these cases. Uh, I think the Octavius decision suggested that pharma cases are about $10 million uh, a piece for a brand company. It's significantly less for generic companies because if you can imagine the burden of document production and discovery is much heavier on the company who owns the patent and, and needs to produce records going all the, back, all the way back to conception, et cetera, and so forth. There's also a significant unpredictability inherent in these cases. These are, um, are complex science cases. A lot of times they're, they're um, based in chemistry, pharmaceutics, pharmacodynamics, biochemistry, and um, most fact finders um, don't come at these cases with um, a, an advanced degree in chemistry or, or science. Frankly, most lawyers I've met uh, shun the idea of studying chemistry at all, so uh, it's not always the most um, inviting forum to go into. And um, then I think finally I'll close by pointing out the very significant asymmetry in the risks between brand and generic manufacturers associated with these litigations, because as Jim was pointing out to you, there's really no damage um, damages that the generic pharmaceutical manufacturer will be obligated for. They filed their abbreviated new drug application, they haven't launched the product onto the market, and what the brand company is seeking is an injunction. So there's really no loss to them, absent the attorney's fees, a few million dollars in attorney's fees, to litigate these cases and take a run at these patents. And that is what continually encourages early and frequent challenges to these patents. The brand company, on the other hand, is um, relying on the exclusivity for these patents to continue to fund future innovation. And um, the loss, the early loss of that innovation can mean 
uh, a number of things. For a, a relatively small company whose portfolio is based principally in one product, it can mean the end of the company. Sorry, just... So into this world of complexity and circuit split, uh, the Supreme Court took the case and decided that it should steer a middle path between presumptive illegality, viewed, often viewed by commentators as per se illegality that the FTC and others had been advocating, and the <clears throat> scope of the patent test, which, uh, as Scott explained, had been adopted by a number of circuits. Both of those tests had fairly firm, clear edges to them. The middle course that the court steered was to adopt what's known in antitrust law, as many of you know, as the rule of reason. That's pretty much an everything in test in antitrust law. You throw in everything you can think of as a pro-competitive effect if you're the defendant, everything you can think of as an anti-competitive uh, effect if you're a plaintiff, and then you argue about which predominates. And in addition to steering that path, the court basically said explicitly, we're going to leave it to lower courts to kind of figure out how to apply all of this. So we have a resolution of the circuit split, but we now have a, a new world uh, of uncertainty. And one thing that the court did was talk a lot about large and unexplained payments and how that fit into the rule of reason. And that is the next topic. I know, Scott, you have written about that. If you or Phil want to take the first shot at that, that would be great. You've, you've written about this. <laughs> <laughs> the curse of having written about this. Exactly. So, yeah, so I'm happy to take an initial, an initial crack at this. So um, uh, together with uh, Herb Hovenkamp uh, and Aaron Edlin and Carl Shapiro, we've written a short piece in Antitrust Magazine trying to offer some guidance <laughs> to uh, district judges and also to litigants and how uh, one might interpret uh, the, in some ways, slightly oracular uh, activist decision. We do think there are, uh, there's uh, heft and substance there that one can uh, work through to try to come to a conclusion about how a, a district court should organize one of these cases. Um, I think the, the major point to come to uh, as, a kind of, as a kind of starting point here, is that uh, observing a large payment, or as the court puts it, a large and unexplained payment uh, has important evidentiary and inferential significance to identifying an, an anti-competitive effect. So the major point of the opinion, and I think the major, one of the major thrusts of our article is to suggest that the fact of a large payment, that big red arrow I showed, right? The fact of a large payment is enough, combined with delay in entry, to give rise to an inference of anti-competitive effect. Uh, the anti-competitive effect being the delay in the onset of generic competition. <clears throat> um, so within a, what was mentioned before, within a rule of reason framework, what that means is uh, the plaintiffs uh, have an obligation to identify that that large payment, and you know, there's a little bit of detail underneath that that we can that we can get into, and that because that satisfies a burden of production on the part of plaintiffs, under a standard rule of reason analysis, that's enough to then put to defendants the obligation of defending this large and I think the court is at pains to say suspicious payment. So that's the, that's the, that's the basic move. Um, I think I would, I would offer a somewhat different perspective on what we mean when we say rule of reason. I mean, I understand the perspective that it's a facts and circumstances case and that one can imagine taking everything and just sort of putting it in and stirring it up and saying the words balance and you know, sort of hoping for the best. I think, th I think the way I would look at the rule of reason here is that district judges uh, have a lot of uh, flexibility and even an obligation to trim this down, to organize it, to uh, uh, pay attention to inferences. Uh, you know, a close read of the p opinion suggests that the court was thinking of just that. I mean, Herb Hovenkamp is cited for his famous treatise with Phil Arita 
uh, on several occasions and at the magic points in the opinion where they say what one should go do. And the parts of the opinion that are being cited are talking about how district judges can uh, engage in shortcuts to avoid uh, uh, an indefinite, extremely weighty, all facts and circumstances, all conceivable uh, just possible justifications being brought to bear. And so we think from the fact of a large payment, can we know ye, that is an inference of anti-competitive effect, and that's enough to satisfy the initial burden of production. One issue for discussion uh, that has arisen after the standard was announced was if a burden to explain or justify shifts and could be burden of production, could be burden of proof. We won't, I think, get down to that level here today. How, how is that different from the FTC advanced test of presumptive illegality that the activist court specifically rejected? And I'd ask that on two levels. Maybe, Phil, if you wanted to comment from the, from the case law or rule of reason side, and then Lorianne, as a practical matter, what, what <coughs> guidance or does that give you in trying to structure these kinds of settlements? Yeah, I think on the higher level, um, uh, you know, I think the difference is it, it depends a little on what, as Scott was saying, a little bit on what the plaintiff has to come forward with in the first instance. And I agree with everything you said, that I think if you look at the language in the activist decision, it really does seem to describe a pretty circumscribed set of usual factors, right? It doesn't, doesn't take everything completely off the table, but it does suggest that you're not required to rummage through all the potential arguments and all the potential justifications and so on. That it actually can be circumscribed and focused in a way that fits the particular uh, case. Um, given that, I think, I think I agree with Scott that, that sort of showing that there is in fact a large uh, payment and by doing that, and maybe this is, this is where the deviation from the pure uh, presumptive illegality comes, but by having to show that there is in fact this reverse payment, the big arrow going the, way, the other way, and it is large, whatever that means, and I, we may talk about that in a bit, uh, that that's, that's showing something more. It's doing something more than just saying, well, there was a settlement and a payment. Um, and, and saying that the burden would be on the plaintiff to first show or at least come forward with evidence of uh, non-justification, sort of saying these were in fact all payments for delay, they were not payments for legitimate services, they weren't all the sorts of things that we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, would transform this sort of initially into something much, much more. And so I think we are in between the just uh, presumptive, there's a payment, it's illegal, and the you know, it's, it's full-blown rule of reason. Plaintiff has to come forward and show sort of everything to start with. And, and Laurie, from a, from a pharma industry standpoint, does, does the test that Scott and Phil have just described feel any different than from presumptive illegality, such as found by the Third Circuit and as the FTC has been advocating for many years? So this is the point where I should um, confess that I, I don't hold myself out to be an expert in antitrust law. I'm, I'm just a patent attorney. And as I understand the patent law, if you develop an innovation and you publicly disclose that in a patent that is duly granted by the United States Patent Trademark Office, you're entitled to a period of exclusivity. I understand the patent law to provide that. The way that I read this decision is perhaps biased by the perspective that I bring to it. I read this decision as saying a large unexplained payment, and let's be careful here to make sure we understand that payment does not always mean a large sack of cash. What payment means is a big question in my mind, and, and I know we'll talk more about that. But the way that I read this decision, a large, a large unexplained payment is a surrogate for assuming patent is in, is, a patent is invalid. And I don't know how to reconcile that with the very substantial body of case law that says a patent once granted is presumed to be valid. So from my perspective, the way that they've laid out this, this test, they, it's not just that the invalidity of the patent is assumed from a large unexplained patent, pay, excuse me, payment, but in addition, they seem to be assuming market power 
from a large unexplained payment. There's very little discussion in the Octavius decision about market power. I don't know the details of the market power behind testosterone products, but if you look at Nexium, we're talking about a proton pump inhibitor, a second generation proton pump inhibitor. You don't want to pay for Nexium. There's Prilosec. Before that, there was H2 antagonist, ranitidine, and before that, uh, Tagamet. I think Tagamet went generic in the 80s, for Pete's sake. So I, I think market power is an important part of the analysis that seems to be really just rolled up into if we find a payment, whatever payment means, whatever large means, we're going to assume market power and we're going to assume the patent is invalid. And so for me, I'm not sure from a practical perspective how an in-house lawyer advising its business can counsel management on how this differs from the quick look test. Uh, before we move on to what is a large unjustified or unexplained payment, Scott or Phil, do you want to uh, comment perhaps on Lorianne's question about how the activist court uh, addresses either explicitly or implicitly the market power uh, issue? Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to say something briefly. So, I, mean, I think the court's basic take here is in some ways a modern antitrusters take, uh, which is if you have something that looks like an anti-competitive effect, if you have something sufficient to give rise to an inference of anti-competitive effect, one needn't necessarily separately prove market power. So we have a not that uh, new a case, uh, International Federation of Dentists, which tells us that in situations where you have a good anti-competitive effect story, market power needn't be separately shown. There are other cases where you would separately show market power. Um, and uh, to kind of make assurance doubly sure, in the opinion, the court basically says, you know, where a reverse payment, one of these payments from the brand of the generic, <laughs> threatens to work on justified and competitive harm, the patentee likely possesses the power to bring that harm about in practice. And then cites uh, Herb Hovenkamp again in the treatise um, that the size of the payment from the brand to the generic is itself a strong indicator of power. So it's a, it's a bit of a tailbone here, right? It's kind of I, I'm, I'm both telling you, you don't need to worry about market power at all. And separately, the court, which seems to be paying a little bit of attention to market power, is kind of checkmarking it, uh, checkmarking it in, in, in passing. Um, I don't think this, though, is a case in which you know, we were necessarily assuming market power simply by virtue of the possession of a patent. There's been a fight in antitrust for a while uh, about how that kind of inference is inappropriate. Um, and that's not the point being made here. It's that the fact of a large payment uh, gives rise to this uh, additional inference. All right, let's, let's move to the next topic because this is what is right at the heart uh, of the activist decision. Uh, the court many times talks about unjustified or unexplained payments uh, and large payments. And uh, there are many open questions. Is that just a bag of cash, as Scott said? Is it something else? I think, Phil, you were going to lead off on this area talking about some of the subsequent cases that have applied activists and, and dealt with some of those questions. Yep, absolutely. And, and this really is one of the, the sort of current, very open, and I think most important questions, right? What does, what makes a payment for purposes of the activist large payment uh, standard? And you can imagine a range of scenarios from Scott's bag of cash, right? Here's $800 million dollars delay your entry, uh, that's pretty straightforward, through an agreement by the branded company not to introduce its own authorized generic to uh, other sort of financial considerations such as um, forgiveness of damages or a debt from some other situation, some other litigation, some other lawsuit, something else, uh, to settlement of unrelated litigation perhaps. Uh, but as effectively payment for the later entry um, to uh, licenses, right? To licenses for product or distribution or something else. So it could take a bunch of different forms. There are essentially, there, there's currently a disagreement, not surprising, uh, among the district courts that have looked at this issue about what constitutes a payment, um, and in particular whether only cash payments whether some form may be slightly delayed of the bag of cash that Scott described is, is what's required, or whether some form of economic consideration that's not so simple and so straightforward can count. Um, there are three cases 
district court cases that have decided this issue. There's one that's currently pending. Let me just mention them quickly so we've got them as a background, and then we can talk about some of the specific issues. Uh, the first one is the Nexium antitrust litigation in the District of Massachusetts. Um, in that particular case, the branded company, AstraZeneca, uh, and a generic allegedly entered into an agreement uh, delaying entry, and in return, the generic would get an exclusive license to market the generic product um, during the first 180-day period. So instead of just entering on its own using 180-day period, it would get a license to market uh, generic. There was a separate settlement with two other generic companies in that case uh, that involved, none of these involved cash payments or direct payments. Instead, the other two involve forgiveness of contingent liabilities based on past infringement. Uh, and the court, uh, in that case, denied a motion to dismiss. Um, uh, uh, applying Actavis said, I'm not going to adopt a narrow reading of Actavis that only applies to, to just cash payments. Nowhere in the Actavis decision did the Supreme Court say this is limited just to cash payments. And in fact, uh, such a narrow view of what constitutes a payment would be inconsistent with the broader uh, sort of goal and the broader economic uh, uh, message of what the Supreme Court was trying to do in Actavis. Uh, the second case, District of New Jersey, is the In Re Lipitor antitrust litigation. There, also no cash payment, no direct payment. Instead, the settlement uh, was the generic, again, delaying its generic entry, uh, agreeing not to give up its first filer exclusivity and withdrawing its challenge to the, the patent. And in return, Pfizer, the branded company, agreed to, one, forgive uh, uh, outstanding money judgments that it had obtained against the generic, uh, and two, to license the generic to market uh, a generic version of the drug in some international markets. So again, no direct cash changing hands. Um, uh, in that case, the court, uh, and, and I think it also involves settling litigation over a separate drug or some, some additional litigation somewhere else. Um, uh, once again, the court said, nope, the fact that this is um, not just cash, that this is payment or consideration in some other form, doesn't matter. Once again, the court said there's nothing in the Actavis decision that limits us just to cash. In fact, it, it's, it's open for us to look more broadly. Third district court decision went the other way. Uh, this is the Lamech Tall antitrust litigation, also in New Jersey from just earlier this year. Um, and in that particular case, the uh, payment there, once again, was not cash. Uh, instead, the generic agreed to drop its challenges, and in return, the branded company, uh, Smith, Smith, GlaxoSmithKline, um, agreed that it would not produce its own authorized generic during the generic's period of first filer exclusivity, or during this 180-day period that Scott described. The branded company said, we agree not to uh, sell our own authorized generic. And we'll talk about authorized generics more in just, just a bit. Um, uh, and the court there said, uh, nope, it's got to be a cash payment. Actavis itself involved a cash payment. It doesn't say anywhere that, that other forms of payment could count. Uh, it's really just... Uh, and, and the court considered the other two cases I just described and says, I don't think those are right. I think the proper reading of Actavis is if it's not a cash payment, then it's not uh, a payment for purposes of antitrust scrutiny. Uh, final case, no decision yet, but wh where this issue is pending is the um, Effexor XR antitrust litigation also in New Jersey. Um, and in that case, uh, again, the payment or the compensation, the economic value or consideration, if you will, um, was the branded company agreeing not to market its own authorized generic, its own version of Effexor uh, in return for uh, a delayed entry. And the defendants there made the same argument, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, as in the Lamictal case, no cash payment, nothing here triggers Actavis, so the case should be dismissed. FTC has filed an amicus brief, uh, not surprisingly, saying, no, 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 that's wrong. You need to look at economic factors overall, not just is it a cash payment or not. Thanks for that review. I think the question 
may be in light of that review of uh, some of those cases and the arguments made in them is whether there is any term in a Hatch-Waxman settlement agreement other than an agreed date of entry and the dismissal of the litigation that cannot be characterized as some form of payment going to the generic. You mentioned authorized generics. Um, we'll talk a little bit later about uh, licenses that may come back to the, uh, to the patent holder, uh, distribution agreements. Uh, there are many, many different terms that are frequently used, I think, in mm -hmm. settlement agreements. And so I think a fair question is, are, are, is there anything left that's not susceptible to challenge? Scott, I'm sure you've got views on this. My very quick take is... His quick no. answer is no, probably. <laughs> <laughs> and mine probably is, too. Uh, you know, it's a familiar antitrust concept to look at the economic reality of arrangements and look at what's really going on and not look at just the form of the payment. So, you know, if you take the bag of money and divide it up into these very clever services or agreements not to compete or something else, the economic reality is the same. And I think as a legal and economic matter, that's right. As a practical matter of proof and counseling and so on, I think that can get complicated, though I think the courts can deal with it. But, but my sense is we need to look to the economic reality, and if economic value is being passed to the brand, the generic company to delay its entry, then that's a payment. We still have the other questions. That's not the end of the story. You still have to say, is it, is it large? Is it unjustified? But it should be a payment. Just two, I, I agree with that. Two, two thoughts that I would just add. One, uh, Lamictal's at the Third Circuit now, I think. Uh, in some ways, this is an unfortunate posture for defendants across these cases. The district court took the view not merely that a no authorized generic doesn't count as a payment, but because activists repeatedly said the word cash, because it was cash, right. because the posture of the case made that possible, uh, here I stand, it has to be cash. Now, I mean, that would be trivial to work around, right? You hand over title to land or gold <laughs> bullion. Um, it can't be the case that only cash, right? We can talk about what the boundaries are, but it can't be only cash. Uh, and so I think it's going to be easy for the Third Circuit, uh, perhaps easier than it would be in some other case, to understand the uh, error of the district court here. The second point I would add is uh, no authorized generic is actually worse than handing over cash. Uh, when you hand over cash, you're transferring value but the thing being transferred is not itself preserving of market structure. A no authorized generic provision is actually worse because it keeps one product out of the market. The right. way in which value is conferred is by keeping one competitor off of the market. Um, so even if you, you don't care, even if you don't follow any of the reverse payment stuff, this is a separate and in some ways fairly garden variety limitation of competition among rivals. So even if you felt not as hawkish as some of us do about reverse payments, a no AG provision might stick in your craw separately because of this way in which it's worse than a mere transfer of cash. And I think that that last point's exactly right given, you know, there's, there's plenty of language in activists, but, uh, you know, it includes uh, language where the court basically uh, it says, you know, what the focus is payments in return for staying out of the market that keep prices at the patentee set level while dividing up the monopoly profits uh, between the patent owner and the generic challenger. The goal is to maintain these super competitive profits and share them among the patentee and the challenger. And that's exactly what you get in the, in the no authorized generic, right? You take what would have been a two rival market, the branded company, I'm sorry, a three rival market, a branded company, its generic product and the uh, generic entrant, and you effectively turn that you know, into a continued monopoly. So the generic stays out and the, the uh, branded authorized generic stays out. So from a consumer standpoint, antitrust standpoint, instead of three competitors, there's still none. The monopoly period is extended. So after that, you might be expecting that the Federal Trade Commission can re require brand companies to actually launch an authorized generic. Is that the next step? No, I'm, I'm in all seriousness. There are plenty of brand companies whose philosophy does not involve invoking authorized generics. 
They're not interested in doing them. They're not interested in agreeing to do them. So if that provision is included in their agreement, they may be just giving nothing more than the sleeves off their vest. The argument assumes that there will be an authorized generic in every instance, and that's simply not factually accurate. So how, as a branded company, if you're not in the business of doing an authorized generic, if you include one of these provisions in your settlement agreement, how do you show to the satisfaction of the Federal Trade Commission, assuming you're even willing to take on and invest to do this so that you, you know you're going to take on investigation from the Federal Trade Commission, how do you show that you weren't intending to do an AG in the first place? I, I don't know how to do that. So that, that may serve as actually a segue to the next topic because in the end, of course, it's not just a payment, it's an unexplained or an unjustified and a large payment. And I think a lot of the clarification that will come from the lower courts over the next years is going to involve what justifications or explanations will be accepted, how will they be proven, who has the burden. For example, could one defend by saying on an authorized <coughs> generic payment, we weren't going to launch anyway, so there's no payment there. Uh, so why don't we turn to the next topic of what may explain a payment and, the, and uh, Justice Breyer's uh, remarks, his holdings direct, uh, addressed at that in the activist decision. He's, he mentions three things, and they're listed there uh, on the slide. Uh, traditional settlement considerations, which I think is the broad remainder category that encompasses lots of things, and there may be an argument about what that can't encompass. We'll probably come to that. Avoided litigation costs, because after all, the litigants are saving money by not litigating, so uh, we ought to end up in the same place if at least that can be transferred. And then fair value of goods or services. We mentioned in a lot of situations historically, these cases have been settled by having contemporaneous business agreements, licenses, uh, active pharmaceutical agreement, uh, supply agreements, uh, distribution agreements, promotion agreements, and the like. And the court seemed to recognize that if those were transactions for fair value, not sweetheart deals, that that could be a sufficient explanation uh, for anything that looks like a payment. So let's perhaps take these in reverse order of the way they're listed on the slide and, and deal with the catch-all at the end. Um, anyone want to address some of the issues involved in fair value for goods or services? One clear issue seems to be how do you, how do you benchmark that? What, what, how can you find fair value, particularly when some of these things that uh, are implemented at the time of settlement are not in heavily traded markets. Like, the, you know, like you can't look up the Dow Jones average for API agreements or whatever. So someone want to kick us off on those subjects, please? I'll, I'll say just to, to just barely introduce the subject, you know, I think there are a range, right? I think there's some things where it's a pretty clear direct transaction, whether it's selling assets or know, possibly selling one particular drug or something like that where, you know, the values are relatively known. It's not um, that hard to value. It's the sort of thing that gets done periodically. I think it gets much, much harder at the other end that you were describing. If it's licensing for something where there's very little comparable licensing, very few things to point to to compare, then I think as a practical matter, as a proof matter, uh, it gets a lot harder. Phil, you, you litigated for 20 years. How do you see this getting proved? How does this unfold in a courtroom right, when so, there's a debate about what is fair value for one of these transactions? Right. I mean, first, you know, I should say, it, again, there may be edge cases where you're talking about licensing of, of something where they're just, it's such a thin licensing market, we have very little to go on. But in general, these are not completely new questions. I mean, these are the kinds of questions around valuation and so on that courts and, and agencies and litigants deal with all the time. So I don't think we should feel like we're somehow cast into whole new territory here. I suspect expert witnesses will have a large role to play, and I suspect people have a strong reactions as to whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, 
But I think you know it's very much that kind of proof that gets put on in plenty of other cases. Evidence from companies' own documents about uh, what was behind the transaction, what they were doing, how they valued it, um, uh, you know, and so on, are going to be very important. Sometimes those can tell a lot, even if in the abstract things would be pretty murky. The story may be pretty clear, and that's obviously how you know lots of cases get litigated. Experts are going to be very important. Um, Scott. So just two thoughts, uh, the first of which tailing on off of the last thing. So as a concrete example, uh, in the case that we talked about in the Supreme Court, the activist case involving this drug Android gel, uh, a document that has been unsealed from the litigation over the brand's objection, over Solvay's <laughs> objection, is an internal an analysis uh, by somebody at Solvay working out litigation, uh, basically saying, okay, well, we're going to earn this much money if we win, this much money if we lose, taking the average between those, suggesting it's a 50-50 shot, this much. If we can get the generic to delay till this year, we'll earn this amount. If we can get them to delay three more years, we'll earn more. But they're not going to agree to that. So to make up that difference, we'd have to give them X million dollars. So they, they sort of work out how much they'd have to pay in order to achieve the delay of entry that would increase their profits. And then they walk through, after doing all that in the same slideshow, they then walk through different strategies for conferring value on the generic. Maybe we do a marketing deal involving urologists. Maybe we do it this other way. So when you have internal evidence that first they worked out a pay for delay deal internally, and then they tried to figure out how to disguise that through, a, through an ancillary transaction, that would be a different kind of evidence that would bear. A, a, sec, a second thought about how you might generate evidence would be, okay, how interested are these parties in doing deals like this outside the context of settlement? So, you know, if generics are frequently looked to for standby manufacturing services, then that would be evidence in favor that this idea, perhaps, that this ideal is legitimate. If this generic is never turned to for uh, standby manufacturing or uh, I think uh, perhaps even more perversely for for marketing services, right? Generics don't do as much detailing, I think, as, as brands do. But if nevertheless they're being looked to to do marketing, detailing types of work, that should raise a red flag. I think that would legitimately present an inference that this deal is being used to disguise compensation from the brand to the generic. So those would be two thoughts about proving up uh, I think a in, deal case. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to move us beyond the metaphysical inquiry of what is a large payment uh, and go to the concept of delay. After all, these are often characterized as payments pay for delay settlements. And so the question arises, delay compared to what? What, 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 is, what is the benchmark for delay? And there, it, it may be a more difficult question than appears on first blush. Uh, anyone want to start us off on that topic? I will. I, I, I can identify the three candidates, I guess, that at least come to my mind. One would be the in the but-for world, when would litigation conclude? And I suppose, if so, at the district court level or at the federal circuit level. A second possible benchmark is if this settlement had a payment, what, when would the settlement have occurred? What would the entry date be without a payment, if you looked at it? And the third would be harking back to, and maybe there are more, but these are the three I can think of. And the third would be harking back to Scott's slides initially about maybe there's a 50-50 expectation of how you come out is kind of the probability weighted expectation between the end of litigation and the end of patent term. And for, for those who've, who've been working in this area, that's kind of the probabilistic patent theory is the, is the name of that. So anyone want to pick one or more of those three or quickly address this subject for us? I'm happy to, I'm happy to kick this off um, and then have Bill and Scott disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. Um, <laughs> to talk about it in terms of the delay of the generic entry seems to me to already presume that they were entitled to enter earlier. So 
it's, it's almost, it's a conclusion that's already been made. So as a patent owner, we're already on the back foot, right? So that's the first thing that I would mention. Um, it's really not a delay, in my mind, if it's within the scope of a valid patent. In that, if that's the case, there's no delay, regardless of how much money you pay to settle the litigation. And, you know, I, I am at a disadvantage in settling these litigations because I have neither a large bag of cash nor bullion. So, um, <laughs> but um, this, the next point I, um, I would make is that the practicalities of how these cases are negotiated, um, I, I don't want you to assume that whatever the documents um, that have come out in the activist litigation seem to suggest, um, the practicalities of how these cases are negotiated doesn't lead to an appropriate assumption that the entry date and other provisions are negotiated at the same time. So if you imagine a scenario where an entry date is agreed first, and then the rest of these parameters, be they manufacturing, be they uh, licenses in foreign jurisdictions, what have you, are coming in later, is it still legitimate to call that a pay for delay? There's something to think about. Could, could I ask uh, Phil and Scott to do a very short burst, each of you, on this topic, and then I want to move to patent merits for a few minutes, and then I, I want to leave some time without getting us off schedule for questions. So, any quick comments on the mine delay is, issue? Mine is real quick. Having having you know, had the opportunity to try to set the table with a kind of expected outcome of litigation baseline, I think I'll uh, I think I'll stick to that one. I guess I'm a probabilistic patents guy uh, at heart as to this. Um, although I'm not sure in any I, I expect that in any given case, which we'll come to. Uh, it's not going to be necessary to identify that because the payment itself is going to give you a measure of the... Well, and, indeed, I think most agree it's almost impossible to identify that, which is why people want to go to some other solution, right. like an inference from a right. payment. Right. It's a virtue rather than a weakness of the approach. They don't have to then identify that. Yep. Half full, yep. half empty. I, I agree. I'll leave it with that. Okay. Well, let's... Um, we had a couple of other topics, but I want to move us along to... Uh, the role of patent merits. The one thing the many of the courts had been worried about up until the time of activists, that if you were going to litigate an antitrust case that depended on how a patent case would have come out, a patent case that was never litigated but in fact settled, that you then might have to try a patent case within an antitrust case, and that led a lot of the, particularly the 11th Circuit, to the scope of the patent test, saying that's just, you know, who's ever going to settle if that's, if that's the prize? So the activist court, I think, has, it's fair to say, this topic is addressed by Justice Breyer, and he observes, using words like it may not normally be necessary or it may not always be necessary to get into the patent merits but he doesn't seem to rule it out categorically. So quite a debate has ensued, and this will shake out, presumably, and not necessarily in the same way, I think, in, in, in various courts. What is the role uh, of patent merits? Is it ever part of the plaintiff's case in an antitrust suit? And can a defendant defend by saying, I know you don't like my settlement, but I would have won that patent case, and let, let me show you why. Comments. So, my take is that you don't need to look at the patent, uh, as, and that that is a fair read of the activist opinion. So, uh, I think Justice Breyer for the court was a little more strong uh, than, than, than at least some of those depictions. So, the language is it's normally not necessary. So, normally, we can talk about normally. Normally, not necessary to litigate patent validity to answer the antitrust question. And then he adds a parenthetical unless perhaps to determine whether the patent litigation is a sham. So I read that to be saying no, and normally means unless it's a sham, that that's the exception that, uh, that he has in mind. Now, was the court all seeing and thinking through every single place that you could put, uh, you could talk about a patent? Doubtless no, right? This was an FTC case, uh, uh, thinking about liability, not thinking about damages, right? I think pay for delay cases are even harder than the court understood them to be, and they're, and they're, hard, they're hard cases to kind of work through analytically. Um, 
I think the best read of activists, though, is that we would not be looking directly at the merits of the patent. I think, in principle, you could imagine doing that. So, for example, in my picture before, where I show you how the settlement comes out, where we know what the injury date is, you could bring in experts to say, well, I think the strength of the patent was here relative to the settlement date, or I think it was here, and that that might provide another cut on liability or, or, on, or on damages. Now, my concern here is the same as the 11th Circuit, which I think the court also took up, which is that to do this nested patent trial inside of an antitrust case that was premised on a patent settlement uh, was, um, in the memorable phrase of the 11th Circuit, a turducken task. Right? So turkey nested in duck, nested in chicken, or maybe it's the other way around. Right? This, this multiple nesting, highly unpalatable, uh, you know, it would be expensive, unwieldy, subject to manipulation, uh, and so, you know, best left undone. Yeah, I mean, let's remember that unless that patent, <laughs> unless that patent is I'm invalid. I'm not allowed to agree, but I do. <laughs> unless that patent is invalid, there's nothing wrong with that exclusivity. It's justified by statute. And, and uh, the judge is exactly right. There is a very big disincentive to trying to settle these cases because the parties in settlement are going to have a different assessment of their willingness to take on the FTC's position. It's not just simply what does the case law, what does Actavis say we are and are not allowed to do. There's a whole body of doctrine and pronouncements by the Federal Trade Commission that you have to steer clear of unless you're willing to take on an investigation by an agency that has essentially unlimited resources, something that will drag on for years and years and years and create a distraction. Look how long the Actavis case has been going on. And then the specter of treble damages if uh, private plaintiffs or, or um, the Federal Trade Commission win their case, and, and this is determined a pay-for-delay type settlement, despite the fact that there's no cash payment or, or what? We seem to have morphed into the question period, and just, <laughs> and just at the right time. So I, I know, Mark, you have a comment or a question? Yeah, I, so I, with great respect, I was afraid that was going to happen. <laughs> He said with great respect, not due respect. <laughs> I think it is, I, I think thinking about the question as whether the two parties both want to settle the case is precisely the wrong way to think about it. Of course they do. They want to divide up the market and make sure there's no competition uh, uh, for, for uh, consumers. And I understand why they want that. It will increase both of their profits. That's why they come to the 
settlement, it doesn't follow that we should uh, think that settlement has no, uh, has no anti-competitive consequences. Now, I, you ought to be able to settle a patent case. The, the point about uh, uh, real litigation risk, I think, is exactly right. But I don't think you have to, to pay your competitor to stay off the market is the only way to settle that patent case. Right. And it's worth noting that in the period after 2000 until 2003 or 4, when the only case law here said that it was illegal per se to make these payments, people stopped making these payments, but they didn't stop settling their pharmaceutical cases. And the FTC report actually suggests right, there were lots of settlements that occurred uh, I, I just think the settlement shouldn't be a settlement in which I pay somebody to stay off the market uh, who might otherwise have entered that market. Uh, but a settlement in which you don't change, money doesn't change hands, but I delay entry seems to me reasonable. Um, I, you know, the, the authorized generics, I think, is, a, is a, frankly a stickier issue. Judge, do you want a rebuttal? <laughs> I'll wait until I have a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. This, but the truth of the matter is that litigation risk is litigation risk, right? And they want to settle to avoid litigation risk. You don't know whether paying someone to enter late still means they're entering earlier than they would if the case was tried. No one is comparing the two results. One result is that the, the generic doesn't enter at all until the end of the patent term. That's a perfectly legitimate and frequent result. Everybody seems to be presuming otherwise. And especially with NCE patents, there's only been one that's been invalidated, and that's the Intecavir patent by Bristol. That's on appeal at the CFC, and we're awaiting decision in that case. A compound patent, there, there's been no other compound patent except Intecavir that's gone down. I, just, just to be clear, to set the table in terms of which patents we're talking about, by and large, almost all of the patents that are subject to these pay-for-delay cases are not compound patents. They are almost all of them secondary patents. Uh, I have a short two-page piece with Bob and Sam Pat in a science magazine last year where we go through both the cases that have uh, received attention for pay for delay, they're almost all secondary patents, and also working out the litigation outcomes on compound versus secondary. It's absolutely true, as was said before, that compound patents do get challenged by generics. However, the brands almost always win those cases, something like 90 percent. Uh, for everything else, for everything but compound patents, brands have a litigation success rate in the neighborhood of one in three. Um, and it's those cases that are seeing the reverse payment uh, settlement attention. And not just from the FTC, right? Most of these cases, whatever the FTC does, right, of the 15 drugs that I talked about, you know, FTC is on two of them. The other 13 are privates. So. add the cost of dealing with the uncertainty of an FTC suit or worse, private lawyers who go at these things in the way they've been going at them for a long time where it's really about fees for lawyers. So you're sort of setting yourself up for a quasi green mail thing as well. So we've now made it, we've set the barriers for even legitimate settlements because let's take your example and I don't, you know, you can do the, 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 uh, the quantitative, but so you're admitting that one in three, even of these secondary patents, wins. So the generic is not on the market for the entire term of the patent. And in the other compound patents, two out of three win or 90% win. Uh, so clearly there are a lot of these situations where the generic is not going to come on the market soon. And that is the assumed thing that is driving all of these antitrust cases. And it's raising enormous specter of costs. And there was an FTC press release recently where they were you know, beating their chests like King Kong saying, I'm going to make a billion dollars in penalties off this stuff. That deters those who are earnestly and boringly every day trying to do their job on the, on the judicial branch of government and getting cases settled because there's no way we all know to try them all. It's a little bit after 3.30, so I think I will exercise the moderator's prerogative uh, and thank our panel uh, for the remarks and the great questions and comments from the audience. <laughs>